Good afternoon, um, and welcome to the talk on international law and cybercrime by Tiffany Rad. Um, she'll be discussing international treaties, um, jurisdiction hopping, and other bits, very, uh, very interesting and related things. So please give her a round of applause. Welcome. Thank you very much. It's, it's really fantastic to be here at CCC. Um, my family has a history actually here in Germany as well. And um, let me introduce yourself and, and myself and I'll tell you a little bit about um, uh, some, of the, some of the experiences my family has had here actually, uh, both in East and, and West Germany before the, the wall came down. Um, I'm hacker and chief counsel for Recursion Ventures uh, in the United States. We're based in New York City, and I am their DC office. And uh, what we do is uh, security jobs, red team work. Um, it's a company made up of all hackers, and it's a fantastic place to work. And I'm happy to not only do the legal work for them, but I enjoy actually working on projects as well. I am also, uh, that's where I do half time for my work. The other half time, I'm chief operating officer of Exploit Hub. I sell exploits, and I understand here in Germany this is not a... This is, not, um, this is not legal, so it's not something I'll be talking about during this presentation. Um, but it is something where we, uh, we do, uh, we're a marketplace for people who write exploits and for people who want to purchase them. And that company is based in Austin, Texas, and again, I'm in their Washington, D.C. office. Um, this is my background. As you can tell, I've moved around the world. I've studied all different kinds of places. I, um, I have a BS from Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh, um, but I studied law at uh, Tsinghua University in Beijing, China, as well as at the University of Maine. I was uh, very grateful to be able to be one of the first groups of law students to go to China to study intellectual property. So one of the things I, and they do, they, they've actually patterned a lot of their laws in China um, after American intellectual property laws. So it was fantastic to go there and study with the Chinese um, um, in the law school at Tsinghua. And I also spent, for my undergraduate, uh, a year of undergraduate uh, university at Oxford in England, and I studied there uh, political philosophy and ethics, and, um, and actually biology as well. Uh, I do a lot of traveling, but uh, this is a, some of the stuff that I do right now. Um, I'm an attorney, um, and I also have a degree in business, and so I help uh, companies set up and establish their, their hacker-related uh, in innovation companies. Um, I do some computer science work. I'm more into coding than hardware, so if you ask me IT or hardware questions, I, I may not be able to answer more so than I would with code. Um, I teach in uh, college, University of Maine. I'm in the computer science department and professor there. And I've also recently, as of next year, in fact, I will be a law professor. And I'm helping found one of the first in the United States, um, one of the first programs for information computer security law. So we're trying to train attorneys to, uh, I'm taking parts of my hacker background and computer science, and I'm training um, lawyers, uh, law students really, to think like hackers and to understand more about the technology in a world in which they really just can't uh, know general law anymore. They need to know more about the stuff that's going on to understand some of the essence of, uh, like for instance, the topics I'm talking about today. So uh, I want um, some of our attorneys coming out of the US to be a little bit more technically minded. Um, I'm also a hacker. I access car computers. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting way of putting it. I uh, want to be careful about how much I, I say about that, but um, uh, that's one of the projects we're doing at Reverse Space. I started a hacker space in Washington, D.C., and it opened up ex almost exactly a week ago. And we have about 5,500 square feet of warehouse space where we're doing everything from reverse, um, reversing uh, different types of hardware to uh, reversing malware. So we're having a good time setting up this hacker space, and it's a brand new one. Um, so these are some of my publications and presentations. Some of my car accessing, um, car computer access work has been in popular mechanics, excuse me, and um, Ars Technica and Computer World, I'm talking about that as well. And I presented at a bunch of conferences in the US and also I was very uh, privileged to present at HAR, Hacking at Random, a CCC uh, group. That was in 2009, during the summer, and that was, that was great. Um, okay, so before I start, here's my disclaimer, and, and, and under American law, I just have to do this. Um, I'm a lawyer, but I'm not your lawyer, so uh, my opinions represented here don't necessarily represent those of my employers, because uh, some of the stuff I'm talking about is, uh, um, can be controversial in, in America, so uh, I, I had to put up this disclaimer just so my employers are, are, are happy with that. I'm talking about um, a world in which there aren't any more borders, and in fact, the borders are becoming a lot more difficult to define, and so are secrets. 
when information, and I'm sure many of you know um, where this talk is going to be going with this, but when information can be taken out of places that are secure and very small, um, you know, with small, small drives like this, it's, uh, it's becoming more difficult to control the information from where it's coming and where it's going. And that's why the, uh, what I'm talking about here today is data havens. Legally, technically, ways in which um, we're, as attorneys, we're trying to figure out the jurisdiction, how this works with international law. Um, and also, from a technical perspective, for instance, we need more TOR, tor nodes. Um, it helps us do some more of the work that we're doing, and I'm encouraging all of you and, to get actively involved in that. And um, as I'm talking about um, and no more secrets, there's, um, my family's background here in Europe uh, is interesting, and this is in some ways how I got into this. My family, my father's side is from Latvia, and they've been there for many, many generations in Latvia. And um, when the Germans and then the Russians um, had occupied Latvia, when the Russians, in fact, were coming in, my family actually picked up everything they had and they walked to Germany. And my family was in Germany DP camps, displaced person camps, for many years. And my father spent his childhood here, even though he, he was born in Latvia. Um, they, while they were here, they were very active in trying to get information out to people in other DP camps and to get information um, out to other Latvians who were in DP camps because they were really restricted of how they can share news about what's going on. Um, one of my relatives, an uncle of mine, was one of the first people who uh, put together Radio Free America and they were broadcasting over the wall, this is, this is later on, um, to, to people in, in East Berlin telling them about different things that were going on in the United States. Sometimes they'd have codes, they'd have music they would play that would have messages intertwined in it for people who were politically active in East Berlin. And this was a very dangerous uh, thing to do at the time. And um, Radio Free America, however, is considered to be when, when speech and journalism and publication was, was not easy and was, was, was very dangerous to do in East Berlin. They relied on other places such as West Berlin and places from which my, my relative was, was um, actually on the air doing these um, broadcasts. They rely on this for this information. And it takes people sometimes with this type of spirit of trying to work over the wall, um, work over the borders, you know, the, the difficult, difficulties with the, the government, and take a risk. And my family did this when they came, they walked to Germany, literally. And one of the reasons they did this is they had to leave. They were politicians in Latvia. And at the time, um, there were politicians and athletes, actually. And uh, a lot of the occupying governments knew who they were. And one of the things that my grandfather was very, um, very active about was he was um, uh, falsifying passports, in fact, for a lot of Jewish people in Latvia to get them out of Latvia. And they went to places like Canada. Uh, I think they went to Austria later and also to, um, to uh, Australia. So we got, uh, my family had, um, this is one of the ways in which they, they very, were very active in saying, we don't agree with your government policies, we have some other type of agenda, and uh, we're going to do this, but we're going to do it at great risk. In fact, we're going to have to leave our, our homeland, walk to Germany, spend years in a DP camp, and then be shipped over to America to work in cotton plantations, actually, uh, for many years. But uh, my family has always been very active in politics and in legislation, and this is how I, part of my background, uh, comes a lot from my family's experiences here in Germany. So for me being here, it's fascinating to see the wall and uh, to, to do this. This is my second time in Berlin, in fact, but to be here and talking to all of you. I'm very impressed with how politically active you are and how you're very interested in making change. Um, I've presented a lot of hacker conferences in the U.S., and they have a little bit of a different feel to it, but what I'm really intrigued by here at CCC is people have the technical presentations, you know your technical stuff, but you really also care about the social dynamics of the implications of that. Um, I mean, I, I got to see the protest that was here. It was absolutely really interesting. I've never seen a protest at another uh, hacker conference I've been to, but you get involved, and that's why I feel honored to really be here and talking to all of you about, uh, uh, about things that you're working on. I'm studying back in the U.S., and for me to actually be able to uh, meet with people from the Pirate Party, uh, talk with people from Sweden, I mean, actually talk to, to Daniel about OpenLeaks and, and people from WikiLeaks, it's really interesting to me that I read about all this uh, in the U.S. and I study it, and here I am meeting with all of you here at CC, uh, CCC, that uh, it's, it's been a great week. So I have changed this presentation um, as I meet with people and I ask them questions, and this is what this conference is all about, isn't it? is changing the way that uh, you view some things, yeah. <laughs>
so a quick synopsis. I'm going to be talking about there are no more distinguishable borders. Um, walls and communications separating countries are predominantly electronic, and the laws are what um, are kind of keeping, uh, the walls are laws, so to speak, and trying to get over or um, work around some of these uh, laws, shall I say, is, is, is tricky, and that's why I'm talking about data havens here. Um, it's easy for copious amounts of data to be taken out of places or into places, and uh, that's something that I don't think is going to change in the future. It's just going to be become more easy to do that. Um, what compromises a country, in fact, is changing. Um, I know, especially here in the hacking community, and I've been a part of the hacking community for about 10 years, we are a community, we are a society of people. I mean, we're, we're close in a group of friends. We've known each other for a long time. Uh, type of how you affiliate your um, social and political um, groups. I mean, this in the hacking community, we get it. And um, so I'm talking about when we may have other choices about where we put our data, where we consider to be, uh, are we a citizen of the US? Are we, as our data, part of uh, so, you know, a database in Sweden or in Iceland? This might really change in the next 10 years about how we really, um, how we affiliate ourselves with organizations. And intellectual property has a really close tie with um, computer law and cyber crimes. In fact, in the United States, when you go to law school, you have to, there really isn't a curriculum for studying um, computer law or cyber law. You have to combine intellectual property and criminal law together, and uh, it's a tough way to, to come into this field because it's not, uh, being, studying computer law and, and how these things work is not just crimes and how to hard protect intellectual property like with software patents. It's really, there's this gray area in between that we need more law professors and more hackers, people with your technical backgrounds, getting involved, actively involved in changing the laws, making legislation. Um, and, of course, um, one of the things I do study is how are the, the cyber police, and they actually, I'm going to talk about a network of Beyond Interpol that's actually organizing, um, that they're trying to catch up with people that um, are doing something that I, I'm going to call jurisdiction hopping. And I don't mean to imply that it's illegal. In fact, in the, way, in the ways in which I have uh, set it up, it's not. Um, it's, but uh, it's taken definitely a lot of... Uh, a strength and, and perseverance from um, my organization of hacking friends to, to put this together, and I'll talk to you about what we're doing. And um, someone from the Seasteading Institute has approached me and talked about the idea, and it sounds science fiction in some sense, but really, being able to put your servers on a platform that in type of a place where jurisdiction from these countries is not as um, it's more difficult to define in international waters. Studying international waters and law of the sea is another thing that I decided to kind of add into my law school curriculum when I was a student because I thought that this would be applicable about now. <laughs> and control of the internet. Is it possible, you know, to technically switch off parts of the internet? And I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, which countries are more apt to do that and which are not, um, both technically and politically and legally. All right, so. The way I got into a lot of this is I'm going to tell you about a case I've had in the U.S. And this is a case that's been um, very dear to me because I'm, I do this pro bono, um, meaning I'm, I'm a, I work for free on this case. It's called Project DOD versus Dr. Ronald Federici. I presented about this at Black Hat um, last summer. Um, one of my students in the computer science department decided he wanted to create a, um, he wanted to be like an ISP, that um, we had domains where these domains kept getting shut down by other ISPs. So we took in all these orphans, um, so to speak, of websites that no one else wanted to host, like Time Warner didn't want it, and these are big ISPs in the United States. I mean, it's hard to be on the internet when you keep getting your site shut down for infringement or for what you believe is speech, but someone else is saying, hey, you're infringing my copyright, just take the whole site down permanently. So my students set up Project DOD. I became the pro bono attorney for it. And this is what we are. We're a nonprofit organization. We're based in, legally based in Maine and in California. We have servers in both locations. Um, we decided, and I'll tell you about the DMCA in, in a couple of slides, but we decided to say, okay, we're going to give up our safe harbor. Sue us. We, so we're not going to take down the content. We believe that this is speech. You know, we do not believe that this is copyright infringement, and we are not, um, it, I'm not making any judgments about like Pirate Bay, for instance. In fact, I have some slides about Pirate Bay, but the copyright, you know, like the um, Motion Picture Association and music and all that, that's a, different, that's a different fight. We're doing something different with Project DOD. We haven't taken on that fight because other people are, are, are really, they're doing a good job. <laughs> they're handling it themselves. But um, we have had so much difficulty in uh, handling this in the U.S that we have, in fact, uh, moved our servers to Sweden, and to Sol Solna, Sweden. Solna, I, I've been coached on how to say this, but uh, 
please forgive me if I, I don't get some of the names correct, but we've backed up our servers in um, Sweden. We use Tor for a lot of what we do, including Tor Hidden Services. And one of our, our friends, uh, Jacob Applebaum, um, when he read about what we were doing with Project DOD, he said, how can we help? How can we help at Tor? And where can I put, you know, where can we put the servers where you won't have as many complications? And I'll tell you about how that's worked out. Um, but we did this to reduce the incidences of illegitimate Digital Millennium Copyright Act takedown notices. Um, we consider, we got so many, we were considering this to really be a DOS. I mean, they were DOSing um, our, you know, Project DOD. We could not keep the sites up when we get hundreds of takedown notices for the same content within the statutory period that we ended up, the sites were just down all the time. So the DMCA and the ACTA, I know most of you are probably familiar with the ACTA, so I won't focus very much on that, but under the DMCA, um, it's being used in ways that chill free speech. And in the United States, once a piece of legislation like the DMCA has been enacted, it's really difficult to get that piece of legislation gone. So what we're working on doing is, I'm kind of hitting the DMCA from two places. I'm trying to write legislation to change the DMCA, amend parts of it, so slowly we can get to where we, um, those of us who would like it to be um, more with uh, supporting speech and anti-circumvention measures have been very difficult for innovation. The other way that we're doing it is I'm taking the approach through the, um, through the courts. I am taking this case with Project DOD because we consider it to be what we call a vehicle case. Maybe it'll go up to the U.S. Supreme Court someday, we don't know, but it's that kind of hope that you can change it through precedent or you can change it through legislation. Short of having someone who's um, with our interests in mind who is a legislator in the U.S., um, this is the way that we're going to try to change this. Now, the ACTA is, um, sorry, that's if passed. It isn't passed. Um, that's a typo in my slides. Um, many countries will experience similar chilling effects as we have in the U.S., so I encourage you that if you um, uh, get involved, and I know all of you in Europe are, are very actively involved, uh, politically actively involved, I'm happy about that, but the ACTA is very damaging. So all these things I'm telling you about the DMCA, there, there's a part of the ACTA that's just like it, and you don't want to go in this direction. You don't want these problems that we're already having in the U.S. with innovation and with speech. So I'm going to give you three hypotheticals. You know, so there are hypotheticals. As attorneys, we like that, because then we don't have to necessarily talk about real cases. Um, so we kind of get, get out a little bit. One of these is a real case of mine, and the other two may be. But I, I'm not going to specify whether they're, they're true or not. But you, I'm leaving it up to you to make that judgment. All right, so silencing security research. What if you're a big researcher? You, you, know, you do some awesome stuff. Um, you find some you, a vulnerability disclosure. Um, you have an O-day. Um, you want to slow down the other researchers, so you file multiple DMCA takedown notices to that other researcher's ISP. Like, you want to be the first to drop that O-day. You decide to let the ISP sort through whether or not the takedown notice is legitimate, because you can do that. Um, if you, in bad faith, follow, follow, uh, file a takedown notice, that is not permitted under the DMCA, but good luck on the other side trying to prove that you had bad faith. It's, it's very difficult to prove that, that the other party did that really to shut your site down. So the result of this is the, the researcher's blog, social networking accounts, and the company site are down. You post your day, you get it out first. The unfair corporate advantage is the second hypothetical here. Let's say you run a software company, and you and your competitor are going to launch similar products in the marketplace at about the same time. Um, you want to be first to market, that's always an advantage. So your ISP gets flooded with DMCA takedown notices regarding your new software source code, saying, hey, that's copyright infringement, that's mine, you took it. The result, most if not all of your company's site is removed by your ISP. So the day you plan for launch, you have no online presence and you miss being first to market. And here's the last one that is closest to my case. In fact, this is the one that is, <laughs> it is my case. Um, so let's say you've been injured by medical techniques implemented by a physician or a psychologist, and you'd like for other doctors and patients and parents to know that, um, in fact, this, there is something that went wrong with your treatment. In fact, maybe even your child had died from this treatment. And you put up a website, you want to talk about it, and you want to say, hey, this doctor did this, and I don't think this was proper or correct. You should have a right to do that, right? That's speech. You're talking about what you believe to be truth, and it happened to you or your child. The result, your blog, your critique mentioning the doctor's name is offline because your ISP has received multiple and repetitive DMCA takedown notices and no one can discuss anything online negative about this doctor and his techniques as a result. So are these situations fact or fiction? Well, um, they are fact. <laughs> and uh, the one I'm going to talk to you about is the last scenario with the physician because it's actually a, it's been going on for many years and uh, an episode of Law and Order was made about this, um, about a child who had died from te techniques um, implemented by a doctor. But anyone who critiques him online, 
He slams the ISPU takedown notices, and the content is never, it, it can't stay up. That's one of the reasons we just started putting stuff in Sweden. <laughs> um, so this is the DMCA. It prohibits the dissemination, production, and creation of technologies that circumvent technological measures implemented. Okay, what this really says, it's like DRM. So when I look at, for instance, a car computer, if there's a layer of encryption, even though I own that car, that software on it is something that I want to see what it's storing about me, how the car works. I mean, I, I, maybe I'd like to look at the code because I can. Um, but actually, legally, I cannot. If I break that encryption to look at what's on that code, it can be criminal in the U.S. So, and if I do it, I can never talk about it, and that's a very difficult thing for me, for me to handle, even as a professor. Um, uh, this, uh, there have been some issues with Professor Felton, for instance, in Princeton, where he broke some encryption and has actually asked to do it. It's a very interesting landmark case about this with the DRM, so digital rights um, protection. But, um, the anti-counterfeit trade agreement, um, this has a piece in it, just like the DMCA, about um, the anti-circumvention measures, and it increases, increases a lot of international intellectual and property infringement. It was supposed to be for counterfeit goods, but it's really kind of encompassed software as well. So it's, um, I'm not thrilled that the ACTA has been proposed in Europe, and I encourage a lot of you to, to do what you can to fight it. At least let's see what it says. I mean, that's what's incredible about the ACTA. It's all a big secret behind closed doors. It shouldn't be, because it's going to affect so much about how you innovate your companies, your work, how you, what your speech is online. So 30, this is a staggering number, actually, but 37% of all DMCA takedown notices are invalid. Um, Google made a submission to a carrier in New Zealand critiquing um, a draft of the code that they were going to change a piece of how they handled something that was like the DMCA. And this is what they had to say, and I was um, interested that Google actually came up with these statistics, but 50% of the invalid notices were sent by businesses targeting competitors, so it's being used as an offensive tool to shut down um, other companies. So there's one of my hypotheticals right there. Um, and over one-third of notices were not valid copyright claims. The ones that I've been receiving for, through Project D, DOD are not valid copyright claims, and we get the same stuff over and over again for a very long period of time. So we're all run by volunteers. Um, it's kind of like an open source project. We just, you know, the code just gets generated when we need stuff to be fixed. Um, we're funded by donations. Um, the biggest project, uh, we started hosting underprivileged, like people who really couldn't afford a lot of hosting, but it's switched more toward people who are orphans, uh, people whose sites and their speech, people don't want to hear it, or it's something that is controversial, so we take it. These are our clients. So we're now developing a censorship-resistant jurisdiction-hopping infrastructure. That's, that's actually what I'm, I, I say that we do. Censorship-resistant, because we, as you'll see from this case, we, we did lose. Um, we lost on jurisdiction, which was absolutely ridiculous, but we need to get to a case where we can talk about the issues and challenge the DMCA, but I don't think the courts were ready to hear it. So um, the case background, and this is where I'm going to talk to you about uh, the, the, this was a great case for us in the sense that it's about a doctor and people have died, children have died. And um, this is a doctor that uses reactive attachment, to, he, he, he deals with reactive attachment disorder. It means like when you've adopted a child, if the child doesn't bond with you, he has all these procedures you, you can go through to make them bond with you. And additionally, if you have a child that's difficult or attention deficit or, or something like that, that they're not able, uh, they're, they're hyperactive, he has ways that he, he treats these children. Um, so a group of advocates for children in therapy sprung up, and these are psychologists and a psychiatrist who said, we don't agree with your treatment, we're going to critique your scientific methods and we're going to write about it. That should be right, right? We want to talk about better medical procedures, better ways to practice medicine, do psychology. But if you can't talk about it, well, that's, that's difficult. <laughs> so the Law and Order episode um, about Candace Newmaker, that's the child who, was, who died from this procedure, um, the, the Law and Order episode I think was, came out about six years ago. Um, they changed the fact, uh, the, the facts are the same, but they changed the names. So the background is, um, Dr. Federici repeatedly sued, and I'll tell you, just as of two weeks ago, the lawsuit has resumed again, but he is suing um, these psychologists for libel and slander. Um, he's given up on the copyright stuff because he's known not to go after me because I honestly don't care. I'm free. I work for Project TOD, and if they want to take me to court and say this is copyright, I will go to court and I'll challenge them on it saying this is not a copyright infringement, this is fair use, this is free speech. But there aren't a lot of ISPs that have someone that'll do that, so we need to change the law because not everyone has, you know, the organization has a lawyer in their pocket that'll just go to court whenever you want to stand up for a client. Um, but anyway, um, so the truth should be protection against libel and slander. Well, uh, 
This is exactly, I wanted to show this to you because this is Axe site that I took a clip from it. And I don't want to get too much into whether attachment therapy is, is um, a legitimate form of uh, making children bond with their parent, but honestly, it reminds me a lot about the Stockholm Syndrome in a way, but what, they, what, they, what this doctor has written, and this is a piece from his book. These are, these, this is fair use. When you take a piece from the book, especially for critique, it's supposed to be protected speech, very highly protected. But if you look here, what the doctor does is he advocates if a child's difficult, you roll them in a rug or wrap them in a blanket and you, you pin them down, sometimes for hours. And then um, until they finally submit to your authority, they rebond with you. And then supposedly, psychologically, they have a stronger bond with the parent um, if, you know, once they're released from captivity. I, I, this, is, this is what this is. And um, there's some psychologists, believe it or not, in the US that, that believe it or not, I, I'm not a psychologist, so I cannot judge that still use this type of attachment therapy for difficult or adopted children to make them bond with the parent. But there are many that want to stand up and want to say, we don't agree with this, but this doctor has been so um, vigilant, really, in suing anyone who criticizes him that uh, if you use a piece of his book, just a small piece, and put it up on the website and say, I don't agree with this, you get sued. So they found us through many ISPs taking the site down, and finally they came to us. And when we get the, um, the takedown notice, I go ahead and file a counter notice. And the content has to come down, that piece or the whole site, depending on what the, count, um, the takedown notice says, for 10 business days. Then the content comes back up. And then our upstream provider gets harassed. So they keep, um, he keeps filing up the stream to try to cut us off, like you know, cut our head off so that we can't actually operate. But we have about, um, about 100, 150 domains that we also support. So if the ISP above cuts us off, all of those people lose their sites as well. So the ISP, luckily, um, e EFF, the EFF is not co-counsel, but they have been assisting me with this case, and I'm very grateful to Electronic Frontier Foundation for their help. But um, they went up to the upstream provider, said, don't worry, you know, we'll, we'll, it's okay what you're doing. The content's passing through, so you don't have to worry about giving up your safe harbor provision. You, you don't, you're not liable, you're an ISP. Now, Project DOD, we are, because, um, well, this is a little bit, um, we decided to actually, we, we are saying we're not an ISP. We choose which sites we have, and we will keep them up. So um, Federici had other doctors send the same takedown notices for three months. I mean, we just kept getting these every 10 days. The sites were down. So <clears throat> the common abuses that we've seen through this experience is fair use is not a magic bullet. This, you know, when I showed you that piece from the doctor's book, he'd published it. That's fair use, especially for critique. Not a magic bullet, didn't really work well for us because he kept taking people to court. The statutory waiting period, or we're calling really a denial of service attack, that's how it worked for us, is he found a loophole in the DMCA and it was a DOS. I mean, that's what he kept doing to us. The backdoor takedowns where um, he'd kind of go around and try to get to the higher level parts of the, IS, of the ISP that was um, up the chain from us. Endless chain attacks, he just kept sending the DMCA takedown notices. And this is one that's really interesting, is leveraging a 5112G counter notice. Okay, so if you are filing like, hey, that's my copyrighted information, someone else is using it, I'm filing a takedown notice. You, you have to generally list who you think is infringing. However, for me to file a counter notice, I have to give up the identity of my clients. This is not okay with me because um, I will show you a couple of slides of what we've gone through, but someone, and we, we don't know who, allegedly a group has been hired in Florida who hires hackers, or people like in Russia actually, to uh, libel those of us. The attorneys on the case have received a great deal of libel. We've gotten threats. We've gotten extortion phone calls. It's been difficult, but for the plaintiffs, the plaintiffs, the people in this case, it's been even worse. I mean, I thought my fake Facebook page that someone set up about me was horrible. It was really bad. Theirs are 10 times worse of what they're experiencing. And some of them are women, um, some of my plaintiffs are women, and they have been afraid to come forward because allegedly Dr. Federici, the company that he's hired in Florida to do what he calls clean up his name online, to rehabilitate his online presence, they have been threatening the women in the group. Um, some of the, the threats have been very specific. They're sexist, they're anti-homosexual, um, anti like it's, it's really been difficult. But so there are people who actually would not join my case, women psychologists, because they were afraid doctor, this doctor would really go after them. And he goes after, you know, women's morality. I mean, there's a lot that he'll say about that. He doesn't do that as much for the men in the case, but the women, he's been very aggressive about that. So for me having to say, okay, I'm going to file counter notice, and it's doctor so-and-so, who's this woman who's afraid of you, 
I can't do that. And I have been unable sometimes to file counter notices, which I need to legally do to say I'm not taking the content down. That's just not right. Um, so the liability for the ISP, if Project DOD had lost this case, we would have actually suffered a great financial loss. We probably would have been shut down. So when we stand up and say we're not, uh, we're not going to do this with an EMCA, we're risking really everyone in the comp well, everyone who's the volunteer and the whole, you know, the whole organization. But it re that's really what it takes now to stand up to the DMCA is to put it all on the line. And it doesn't, it shouldn't be like that. But um, examples of waiting period abuse. Um, again, like I said, he figured out through a loophole in the DMCA every 10 days we kept getting this stuff for, for months. And I already, I talked to you about this. This is the counter notice to discover one's identity. He didn't know who some of these women were online because they used pseudonyms or they used like a Twitter handle or something like that. So he wanted to know who they were. So I think sometimes he filed the counter notices, or the notices knowing I'd have to counter with their names, which I did not. So we missed some opportunities to really fight them there. So. What do we do about this at Project DOD? Besides saying sue us, <laughs> we have some uh, censorship circumvention techniques that we've used. Um, we're pulling together a bunch of tools and developing a distributed infrastructure. So it was really interesting to me to talk, when I heard Daniel, uh, Daniel's talk yesterday about a distributed infrastructure is really a whole lot stronger, obviously, than something that's just centralized. So we had to do that at Project DOT, do, DOD too. And that's why we don't just have servers in, in California, we've moved it to Sweden. Um, PRQ is our ISP, and as you know, they're, they're pretty censorship resistant themselves, and they've gotten takedown notice and just said, okay, yeah, and so what? <laughs> so um, I'm, the way that I'm doing this, it's not to obstruct justice, and if this was a case that really was someone was, um, in the U.S., for instance, copying a bunch of movies and they really wanted to just release all these movies, I, that's something that I couldn't in the U.S. really support um, as an attorney. It would make things difficult for me. But this is about speech, and I do care about this a lot. So this is why we said, okay, I'm not going to obstruct justice, but if you want to sue on this, file the notice in Sweden. That's, you can do it, it's possible, it's expensive, it's time consuming, and guess what? He hasn't done it, so we kind of have won in that ground. Um, it's a stopgap solution until there are more widespread protocols. So. <laughs> Thanks. So um, this is a little bit of, of a case that we'd filed. We actually sued him. We didn't wait for him to come to us. We're like, all right, I have some time. I'm gonna go after you, and I'm gonna make you stop sending these takedown notices to my client. And um, this is the case, actually, that unfortunately was filed two weeks ago. He couldn't beat us. I mean, it's hard to beat a free attorney, and with EFF helping us, I mean, we were pretty strong. Um, we had actually four pro bono attorneys on this case, so it was, it was really great. So instead, he's decided to unfortunately go after all the psychologists again. He's going back to his old strategy of um, suing them for libel and slander, when actually what they're doing is critiquing his work. And that's a great sum of money that he, for which he's suing. Um, $300,000 is, is a lot. And they, each one of these, um, I think there are five psychologists who have been sued. They all have had to retain private counsel. I'm not able to represent them because this is in state court. And in the state in which he filed, I'm not licensed to practice. So I'm not able to help them, um, and I think that may have been part of his strategy as well. Okay, this is some of the harassment. I, I, I want to put this up, and there's the website it's on, actually. Um, I want to put this up because this is the harassment that we are going through. Um, Monica is one of my clients. She's one of the women who has really been nervous about taking them on. Um, and you'll see my name up there. You'll see the name of a bunch of other attorneys. And um, this, is, this is really the minor part of the harassment we've gone through online to really take this case. And um, I'm reading that, and I'm like, okay, they've listed me two below Sarah Palin. So I'm like, oh, okay, all right, <laughs> this thing needs to come down. <laughs> um, so it, it, there, for those of you who can't read it in the back, uh, it says, um, which woman does Monica, my client, uh, want in bed? And we all found this to be really offensive because there are four of my plaintiffs on here and two other attorneys on the case. And it's, you know, this is kind of stupid, but this, should not, this shouldn't be happening. He'll post anonymous stuff all over. I, actually, I think it's really the group that he's hired through a company in Florida to, to, they actually have ex given us phone calls saying, if you don't drop this case, if you don't stop this, and don't pay us a certain amount of money, we are, um, we're not going to stop. We are going to slander your name, you know, libel it all over the internet, and you're never going to be able to get work again. So this is the kind of stuff that when you, when you really step out and do this stuff, you, you get this idea. So some of you may recognize this. This is a picture. I, I, I really enjoyed this. It's from Pirate Bay. I didn't make this picture. This belongs to this Pirate Bay. And, um, uh, and what I'm talking about is, okay, I've gone through all this through the American legal system. What are the alternatives now? So um, 
A man can be, can a man be his own island? I mean man in the sense of anyone, um, so please don't anyone take offense to that, but to share openly and freely or not. So when we're talking about rights and speech, we also, intellectual property is tied in with that. You have protections, you have rights over what you say. So ownership of property gives one a way in which he can be his own island. And you can express your individualism in a way that doesn't impede upon another's jurisdiction. It's kind of like um, Mill's philosophy that I have my liberties, and I'd like to say what I say, as long as it doesn't impede on someone else's uh, liberties to say what they want to say. So um, this is necessary to sustain an independent social system. Oops, I, I didn't, okay, I went ahead, but that's good. Um, the nexus between intellectual property crimes and cyber crimes, like I said, this is kind of how American law deals with it. It's, the, it's criminal, or it's IP, and maybe there's something in the middle, but really, there's a lot more in the middle that fills this out. So speech contained in computer code, and I, I discussed this last night with some people who have been working on IMI, and it was really interesting um, to hear about their perspectives on this. But So speech contained in computer code is creating factions of people who seek to find other countries' jurisdictions, like where do you put your stuff? So the stuff for the journalism, the speech about news and stuff going on, important, where do you put that? But where do you put stuff like code? Like the code that maybe some of us have created that um, is innovative and it's, it, someone may claim that it's a copyright violation, but maybe it's fair use. It, code is protected by um, um, the First Amendment in the United States. So political speech gets the highest protection. Somewhere, I'm not saying it's the, the lowest, but there's somewhere in here is where source code gets protection. All of you know write code. If two of you, you know, were tasked to write a program, you'd write it differently. It has creativity, it's unique, and it's not just a function. It's not just the input-output. It's how you do it that gives it, in the, in, especially in American law, code is speech. So um, it is upheld under the uh, First Amendment. So a group came to me from... Um, uh, actually, I work with a group of attorneys that they're very interesting, but they, their practice of law is kind of in virtual worlds. And I kind of got interested in, in this part of it, no place like home, because um, some of us have identities online, World of Warcraft, Second Life, whatever um, you may call it, but they have their own codes of conduct, things in which you, you may or may not do, but yet you're physically also within a jurisdiction where if you go and steal someone else's e-gold or stuff online, um, you actually can get criminally prosecuted here in your real world jurisdiction as well. There's some games, I, I think, when you, it, it really is a contract. You're allowed to steal each other's stuff, whatever. Um, but the ones that I worked on in Second Life, and you don't mess with Linden Lab stuff. I mean, that's, that's kind of the way that if you change some of their code, they, they get upset. In fact, one of the first instances of um, virtual world terrorism took place in uh, Second Life. A group of um, radical terrorists um, took over, they bought an island and blew it up. And, and technically, I, just thinking about how they wrote the code to completely destroy Linden Lab stuff, I mean, they, Linden Lab was not happy about this. But they made a statement about Second Life this way. But in a way in which, in the real world, if these people were th within a jurisdiction in which that was criminal to actually screw with someone's code and break it and do it maliciously, it's interesting to think that they may actually be prosecuted for that as well. Um, so. There are strict intellectual property laws that the reason I'm talking about freedom and speech and like this is that we need to really think about when these intellectual property laws are being proposed, um, how far do you go? Luckily, this did not come into, this was not enacted in the US, but it got pretty darn close to being so. Um, <laughs> the Intellectual Property uh, Protection Act of 2007 was going to criminalize not-for-profit illicit copyright with no evidence of actual copying. When, when you see legislation where you don't actually have to think about the actual, you know, like the DMCA, you just have to allege your copyright was infringed, but a lot of it I found is illicit. I mean, stronger requirements for making sure that this actually is infringement or this actual, this actual copywriting needs to be written into this legislation or uh, it's not only is it it's toothless, but you kind of go after a lot of the wrong people as well. Um, a new crime for life imprisonment for knowing, knowingly using pirated software. I mean, this stuff is, it's really strict, and, but it was the U.S. Attorney General Gonzalez. I mean, this is someone pretty high up in the U.S. government who recommended this, and thank goodness it didn't actually become law. But we do have, we do have this. And I'm here because I'm, I mean, a lot of you know about um, the World Intellectual Property Organization treaties that made up, or that the DMCA. But I just warn, you know, be careful with the ACTA because it's coming and it's very similar to the DMCA in a lot of ways. So, um, as I mentioned, we gave up our safe harbor provision with Project DOD. And um, intellectual property laws and criminal law are inextricably combined in the U.S. law. And um, First Amendment arguments are being heard alongside criminal defense cases. 
So um, for computer internet service provider companies like Project DOD. And when you have the criminal part of the DMCA along with the civil for violating copyright, just like, not, uh, it's not Gonzales's, I mean, that law didn't come into effect, but it's, it's similar. When we're looking at possible, I mean, it wasn't alleged, but I mean, it's criminal if you do violate some copyrights. So you have some copyright laws here too that, um, the versus the US is that are interesting, but um, you, a lot of you know this, so I'm just gonna actually skim through this part. But um, uh, let's see, the British laws, I don't know if any of you know, maybe, may, some of you know about this, some of you do not, and so those of you who do just you know, <laughs> hang with me, but um, they're trying to do copyright enforcement by cutting off your internet connection. So if you are what they consider to be a repeat offender of copyright infringement, they'll just cut off your internet for a week, for a month, for a year, or sometimes you, it, it may be indefinite, but it, it takes a court order to find out who you are from that IP address, so that, that's, a, that's good, okay. So okay, they can't just say cut them off, this is who they are. So there is some bit of a process, a checks and balances, but this is a very strict law that um, part of it, if this becomes, if this actually is enacted, this is gonna be pretty strict within the UK. But um, they may block designations such as Pirate Bay, I remember when Italy did that, um, when you couldn't actually get to it without going through proxy servers, although you wouldn't, you know, going through proxy servers, I guess you might be, um, a, I don't want to say obstructing justice, but getting around roadblocks that are legal. Um, you have to be cautious about that, actually. But, um, so this is some of the stuff that they're battling with in the UK. So this is not just a US issue. It's not just something that you're dealing with here. The UK has some very strict laws coming into effect about cutting off your internet service because of alleged copyright infringement. It doesn't have to, some of it, be actual. So I was really thrilled, actually, with, um, to watch the Pirate Bay case. I watched it streaming for days. Um, and it was really exciting to watch because they really are kind of getting into a new era of court cases that are making the news, and Pirate Bay was very interesting for me to watch. Um, there are pirate, pirate, people from the Pirate Party here in the audience, and it was very interesting to me to talk to people about it. And I know each country has a little bit of a different directive, but um, promoting global legislation to facilitate the emerging information society. So this political party, unlike some others um, that are more, um, not as, uh, shall I say, not as new or you know, up on a lot of the technologies that we have, but they're actually talking about emerging information society. I'd like to see some political parties in the US, in fact, talk about information society in a sense that it's not just how do we control it or how do we put it down, but really embracing, understanding the technology and not being afraid of it, like understanding what can we do to create law that helps the flow of information, but yet for some political parties, maybe still meets the needs of some of the, you know, the interest groups in the US. But um, the Pirate Party believes that the copyright system is unbalanced. And I like this picture, I've, it's not mine. Um, <laughs> if it was, I wouldn't have it up here and on, on, you know, being streamed. But I found this online and I thought it, was, it says, filled with tons of music from the Pirate Bay. Um, privatization, monopolies are one of the society's worst enemies. This is according to the Pirate Bay. And um, they believe that some of that should be abolished. And about privacy, um, all attempts to curtail, curtail these rights about privacy must be questioned and met with powerful opposition. And this is a statement they've made about some of the US's anti-terror policies. Um, so if you are the Pirate Bay, or if you are Project DOD, or if you're any other organization, which I will briefly mention in the next couple of slides, where do you go when you're not welcome? If you can't enter a country, and I'm having some issues right now with one of my companies that actually does, um, we, we buy and sell exploits, but we can't, we can't do that here, we can't do that in France, and we actually have this huge matrix we're having to create of like, what level of encryption is not legal in these particular countries for exchanging information, you know, it, it's very complicated, but where do you go when you're not welcome? So some ISPs will move their websites or links to um, other countries. So um, if there is a matrix such as what I described, but for this type of copyright material um, that you're discussing or critiquing, or where would you put it? And creating a matrix of international laws of where you want things to be, where it's legal to put them there, would be very interesting. And um, South America has some pretty uh, lax laws in some sense. Not that lax is necessarily better, but um, they don't really, uh, how shall I say, uh, the people that I know that have put some stuff in South America, the machines are always down, so it's, um, it's one of the downsides of, of doing that. Whereas I know there are other options, um, places you can put it. Um, I'm a big supporter of Tor, as you can see. I, 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 that's my old laptop, in fact. Some of you who know me have seen it, and like duct taped and everything. but. Um, I got these stickers from one of the developers from Tor. Um, we encourage people to use Tor. It's one way in which you can say, I want to access that information 
maybe in my country I can't read about this political group. In fact, when, when I was in China, I couldn't get to some sites, like I tried getting to 2600 site, I couldn't. Unless you use something like Tor, I know Tor is blocked in uh, China and people have worked ways around it, but to be able to read the news and what's going on, and especially I wanted to read Emmanuel's um, magazine over there online, I couldn't do it in China, and I tried. <laughs> So this is um, something that I've really enjoyed talking to people about while I've been here, but land-based data havens, Iceland, Sweden, and the Netherlands, um, possibly soon the Netherlands. I know they're working this out, but um, establishing countries where um, no matter where your citizenship resides, your data in that country, if you put it in that country, is going to be protected and it won't be just taken down because it's illegal in your country of origin. So the caveats for this are um, government whistleblowers in Sweden um, to be protected um, by laws that were implemented to encourage sharing of information critical to the government it is only applicable to people who have filed for protection. Um, I'm, it's been great talking to people in Sweden about this, and I'm, this is a lot of the stuff I'd read in academia. And I'm, reading, I'm hearing some different things from people about how this actually works in practice, and so um, let me discuss that actually within me. Um, I've been, it's been great to meet some people who have worked on ME. Uh, it's really been a dream to come here and talk to people who are writing this legislation and have been involved in it. Um, because what ME is, and I know you know it, because uh, you've been listening to the presentations here and Europeans are generally very up on their politics here, but um, it takes the best, um, the best of all the protection laws for um, source protection for journalists and the copyright protection. I mean, it takes the best in the world and puts it into one piece of legislation. And I'd really like to see, it would be very interesting if the EU picks this up as, as a whole. Um, but this is one thing that I did not know. I'd read in the papers that um, in Iceland, if this does pass, that, well, it might pass, and if it, the pieces of it do, and it's enacted, that you won't get protection unless you are from Iceland. Um, and I read that in a magazine that's pretty well circulated in the U.S. from an interview. But no, I, I actually was talking to, to Daniel and his wife about this, and they said, no, it's, um, it may not be the case, and they'll protect the data regardless of your citizenship. Now, in Sweden, um, as I was talking to someone just, just right before this presentation, um, how this may be different in Sweden. Um, you may need to associate it with a newspaper, so it's protected as an avenue through that media. But if you have a piece of data such as code that a newspaper is not going to really, excuse me, like uh, really jump on board with publishing that, you may not get that protection in Sweden. But I'd like to think that in Iceland and IMI, it's for journalism, it's for sharing information, but it's also for sharing stuff like code. Code that is speech, and it does have a lot to really say about, I think, society. And um, I'd like to see Yumi um, really, and I know they're going in that direction too, to protect more of the digital information too. So, um, I, yeah, I just mentioned this, but it's a series, it means a series of laws. Um, the libel laws in New York State were interesting that they, they protected against some of this stuff too. And I'd like to see how IMI progresses because I've also read that being a member of the state of NATO, that um, the other NATO countries are suggesting that if IMI is passed in Iceland, it may really kind of be offense to the other NATO countries and this may be an issue. And, uh, I, you know, it, 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 I'd really like IMI to be evaluated, and I hope it, it is, based on its content, and not just if it's, you know, people in uh, other countries in NATO don't like it or not. Um, so I'm um, going to briefly talk about WikiLeaks, because uh, this is something that a lot of people have been talking about this week, and it's been one of my research topics for a w quite a while now. Um, I don't need to tell you some of this. You know that um, Julian Assange was, was director when I wrote this. Now I'm just like, is he former director? I, I'm not really sure. But when I wrote this, uh, he had not been taken into custody. Um, what's interesting is he may not have filed um, in time for the Whistleblower Protection Act in Sweden before collateral murder was, I think it was collateral murder, the helicopter video was um, released. And this is uh, one of the caveats I mentioned that how, do you, how can you be sure? I mean, it's, it's, sometimes it's just like a minefield of laws to figure out, do you have protection in that country? As a citizen, as a company in that country, as your information is on a computer in that company, there's really a lot to be considered. And I think um, this would be, this possibly, I, in my research, I found that looking at the dates of when all this occurred, this may have been a very vulnerable time for Assange. And then when he didn't get his residency, um, I predicted that's why a lot of stuff had to be moved at the time, but um, hard to say. But uh, he was denied, denied temporary residency in October. 
And um, there is a program um, that I saw, and I found it on YouTube, but a guy went around and went to all these, these, um, uh, these not data havens per se, but like data centers. This was one of the coolest um, that I got to see inside without being in Bonhoeff. I got to see what was inside. And um, it was really fascinating. And I know most of you know about this, so I'm not going to go through detail about this. It was a bomb shelter built in 1943. So it's interesting to think that maybe it has like some natural shielding, like you know Faraday cage uh, principles about it. I don't know. I'd, I'd like to see it someday. But um, it's very interesting compared to the data centers I've seen, like Equinix in the US. These are in these gigantic warehouses. Um, this is very much contrasted with that. Um, but it was, it was interesting that that's, is, that's what it takes um, to sometimes protect that kind of information. Um, so I would love to see it. But uh, a while ago, and I, I'm not sure if this is true anymore, but um, one of the directors of Bonhoeff said it did not yet complied with Sweden's new FRA surveillance law. And uh, we have an unbroken, or unbroken chain of fiber optic cables. And um, they were going to inform that their customers were being surveilled if they actually did become compliant with, um, with those Swedish laws. So I thought that was fascinating. That they're, they're kind of doing something that's a little bit uh, out there as well. But something that I saw was very interesting when I read about how WikiLeaks was some many multiple layers of how they protected their information. And one of the ways they did it was they intertwined it with political speech. And in the US, this is also a way that I've seen that a lot of um, businesses have done this. But if you take your speech and put it in with political speech, and they did this with um, pirate, I think it was the pirate parties, or I think it was pirate party speech, which is po politics. It's very hard procedurally in the US and a lot of other countries I've seen to extract the two. So um, that's one of the ways that they protected their data, is that you procedurally have to go through and pick through the pieces. Is this political from a different group, or is this WikiLeaks? I thought that was very fascinating how they did that. Um, actually, I, I'm going to skip ahead, because I, am, I have 10 more minutes. But um, strategies for distributed uh, data storage. So um, one of the things that we talked about at Project DoD is if we have a file, for instance, a video or whatnot, that we want to protect, what are some of the best ways that we can do it? And we looked at how, for instance, DNS root, um, from some people I knew from ICANN that were one of the seven holders of um, root for, for DNS, how they protected their, their, their piece of um, information. And we thought that what might be an interesting way to do it is instead of just putting everything in one data server, or everything in one country, but breaking it up amongst a lot of data centers, um, kind of crypto wrapping each piece of that file, breaking it into multiple pieces and distributing it throughout the world, finding countries in which it's OK to put it, in which they have much uh, stronger protections against it being removed. And uh, that's one of the things that we, we were going to try to do. And another thing about breaking up a big file that's important to you in many pieces is if um, if there's a piece on a computer, for instance, in, um, I don't know, like Israel or, or I Iceland or something like that, that, that really some, um, someone in law enforcement, enforcement's like, this is a piece of a greater puzzle. It's hard for them to prove that if it's a piece as opposed to, we think this is the whole, this has the fingerprint, the key for it being the whole, and you're hosting it, you have a problem. Um, we want to take that. If it's broken up into many pieces, um, and, and I do believe in due procedure, I mean, them going through the law enforcement procedures to get the data is is an important part of our freedom and liberty in these countries. So have them do, you know, this is due process, have them do the work. And um, the parts are harder to get jurisdiction over than the whole. <clears throat> but jurisdiction hopping is, as I, we have done with um, files, with information. As soon as it touches, at least in my case, a server in the US, you, you, you have problems if it's something that is illegal in that country or something they're looking for. Um, back when the internet was young, um, a lot of the traffic came through Northern Virginia, outside of DC, Washington DC, because AOL, America Online, was really big, and like that was the big pipeline. <laughs> it's, it's a pipe, yeah, that went through um, Virginia. And v Virginia passed really strict cybercrime laws to get jurisdiction over the data that was coming from international sources. So as soon as you touch Virginia, the state will assess, do we have a right to prosecute this case or you know, get that person, try to get jurisdiction over them? So the states have been kind of using technological measures to really get jurisdiction over the, the material that they want. Um, I'm going to skim through this too, but you know about this. A lot of people in America don't know about Haven Co. and DEF CON. Well, maybe those of you, um, uh, some of the younger hackers, have not didn't go through this, but I, I knew Ryan Lackey um, way back when, when he'd started, when he'd started um, Haven Cohen Sealand. And that's what it is, or was, um, shall I say. It doesn't exist anymore. Um, the platform is there, but it's just a principality of Sealand. The company Haven Co that did the data hosting is, is not there anymore. 
it was geographically a difficult place to go to, and they claimed that they had um, a sovereign nation. And this is one of the difficulties with the sovereign nation that I found. When I, this took a while to dig up online, but what you're looking at is the World War II, um, this is what, the, when they built this in World War II, this was actually a boat that they, they dragged out there and then sunk it. They put a bunch of sand in the bottom. And when you study international law of the sea and that type of admiralty cases, if something is its own country or what country that boat or ship or platform or island belongs to has a lot to do with how it's physically connected to the, it, the continental shelf. Is it the shelf on which the UK presides, you know, that the UK continent is on, or is it part of the intercontinental shelf? Well, the problem here is because it's just sitting on top of the shelf, is some people said it's, it's a boat. It's, it's a platform that belongs to the UK. So the UK would never recognize this as a sovereign nation. Um, they haven't, maybe they will in the future, and I know the royal family's been working on that, but it hasn't worked out so far. But what's interesting about this type of, ha this data haven, um, the free world just milliseconds away, they did have issues with internet connectivity. Um, they did have issues with like real pirates, and I'm not talking about like, you know, what <laughs> the pirate party, but real pirates showing up with guns and kidnapping them and stuff. But um, this is one of the, uh, aspects that was interesting is they took this and um, the Prince of Sealand uh, took this in the 1960s for a uh, pirate radio station based on a, a property that we have in the United States too. It's called abandonment by dereliction in the UK. In the US it's called adverse possession. In the US you can't take the government's property no matter how many years you squat on it, but they claimed this was a sovereign nation and they owned it and they took it over from the UK by it was abandoned by the UK. So if you're looking for an island somewhere that you want to set up your servers and stuff like that, um, abandonment by dereliction, maybe it works. <laughs> um, as long In the US, you can't do it with all the islands we have offshore because they're mostly owned by the US government. Um, international jurisdiction, uh, just briefly to summarize, the US could not really, they had a difficult time with Haven Cohen Sealand, especially um, after 9-11. Um, the prince and uh, the principality said they would abide by U.S. Patriot Act changes and DMCA laws, but it was something that um, uh, the U.S. Was diff had a difficult time with. Getting jurisdiction over the information on that platform would have been very difficult. Um, so what happened to Haven Co? It's gone. And I'm going to uh, put these slides up with, um, with CCC so you can go to these links, but Ryan talks about what happened, and it was a financial fight they had. So is seasteading the next step? Um, the uh, Sean Hastings, I believe, is one of the organizers and funders of the Seasteading Institute, and they're gathering people and money and lawyers to see if this can be done. Um, so is this um, international, uh, as these, these things spring up, so is um, international cybercrime cops. And there is a U.S. Department of Justice task force on IP. They've recently taken a person out of Latvia, and uh, so that's, that's kind of ongoing. Um, speaking of Latvia and kill switching parting parts of the internet, which is what I wanted to um, bring up briefly, um, Latvia was one of the first countries to have this done to them. There's a lot of malware coming out of Latvia for political, economic reasons. I can't really explain, but it just is. And, uh, as, and someone said this may be one of the top European centers of crap, and, and this was not great for me to hear this, but um, so what they did is the entire ISP was just cut off from the internet. They could do that technically the way this was set up. China can possibly do this, and I have, um, let me skip, yeah, China, the way that they have structured their internet, technically, there may be about a handful of places where they could actually cut off pieces. Now, for the U.S., not so. The U.S., the internet's more like a grassroots, it's kind of grown up from, you know, it's early stages of the internet kind of occurred there, and not in China so much. So it'd be much more difficult. If you cut off parts of the U.S. Uh, internet, it's kind of hard to see what will happen. Uh, maybe parts of our government will get shut off at the same time, they just don't know. So I don't think the U.S. T can do this technically yet, but I think they're, they're working on it. Um, so in the future, take your pick. Um, Where's your jurisdiction going to be? Where you put your information, your content in Iceland and Sweden, but you may reside and live in the United States and be a citizen of the US. Or is it going to be you're going to put it somewhere out in the ocean and that's where your computers are going to be and your online identity. So um, in a world when we have IP addresses and GPS coordinates only, the lawyers and cyber cops are playing catch up if we remain steeped in traditional criminal and intellectual property laws. We need more lawyers to be hackers, to think like hackers, if they can't be hackers. And I'm glad to see that there are other attorneys here that have come and talked to me and said, I, I wanna, you know, I'm just learning about the hacking community. I, I really am interested in changing some of how this works. <clears throat> so property ownership will give the future citizen his own island. I, so yes, I think it's possible to kind of have your own island. 
And um, there's my contact information. You can email me. Um, that's my, my email account at Gmail. Um, Exploit Hub, and I cannot solicit for what we do there here in Germany, but that, that's my email address. And Recursion Ventures for the security work that I do. So thank you very much. <laughs>